for tonight was actually to finish up with, since this is our last class of the semester, uh, until we get back for the spring semester. So, um, which is kind of wild and crazy because with most parishes, you maybe take a break of a week or something for Christmas. For us, it ends up being close to two months almost. I mean, at least like a month and three quarters, basically, until we get back together at the end of January. Um, because we pretty much follow the the schedule of the the university schedule, and I happen to be gone the first week that school starts back up, so we won't have classes that week. Um, so it'll be the following week. So, which should be included on your calendar. What does it have down as the first? Yeah, so that's the week after that first week of classes will be the first week we start back up. So, so I wanted to I wanted to get to because I haven't really gotten to some of the questions that came up in the question and answer basket uh, so far this year since we're at the end of the semester and we kind of are at a at a pausing point as far as our lessons before we start in with the spring semester classes. So um, some of those questions I'm going to spend the next half an hour just going through a, a few of those questions. Um, if there are questions that come up as I'm going through, please feel free to ask for clarifications or for follow-up questions or perhaps it triggers a question of a completely different topic in your mind, which is fine. I'd rather answer knowing that the questions are yours rather than Tuesday night because I have a mixture of both Tuesday and Wednesday night in the box, so I'll try to get to those. We may not get through all of them tonight, but get a good chunk of those. Um, there were a couple of questions on the Eucharist, which I'm gonna we got into answering last week, so I'm not gonna go into those, or I basically answered them last week, so we're not gonna go into those. Um, one of the questions that was a fun one was why do Catholics tend to start in the seated seating in the back and then move towards the front <laughs> yeah that's actually a really good question um, I honestly there's there's two types of answers to that question part of one of the answers I would say is because we are creatures of habit and we tend towards well I know for myself oftentimes if we grew up cradle Catholic from the beginning sometimes it depends on where our families tended to sit and that many people will continue to sit in the general vicinity even if it's not the same church they'll continue to sit in a in a general vicinity, if it was the middle of the church, they'll tend more towards the middle of the church. If it was the front of the church, they'll feel more comfortable towards the front of the church. If they always sat in the back, they'll probably continue to sit in the back. Um, it may not be true for you, but I know that's especially true for me in my life. Like we always sat in the front, like at least the first couple of pews, which had to be crazy for the families that were behind us, or the people that were behind us, because we had there were six kids, and so I'm sure we were screwing around and stuff and distracting people and whatnot. But it was good for us because the closer you, I mean, especially with kids, the closer you are to the action, the more you'll tend to possibly pay attention. Um, so, so I think that's part of the answer. I think another part of the answer is a little bit depressing in the fact that there is, with the expectation of Catholics to keep holy the Sabbath, and traditionally that's done by going to Mass on Sunday, with that expectation of attending Mass on Sunday, comes with a tendency towards kind of checking your, your work card mentality of, well, I did my duty. Um, I'm going to do my duty to the least minimal possible sacrifice on my part, so I may show up five to ten minutes late and leave five to ten minutes early, but I did my duty. 
Um, I think there's some of that mentality within uh, some Catholics. Um, not everybody shows up late and leaves early, but there is some of that. There is some of that mentality which I think can be chal challenging. Um, and I don't bring that up to to cast judgment because uh, I think it's definitely a good thing to continue to practice it. I know for me, even though in college, I, and I talked about this in the beginning of the year, because of the fact that it was ingrained into the core of my bones, I continued to go to Mass in college, even though it wasn't internally something that was affecting, well, it wasn't something that I not knowingly was affecting my life. It wasn't something I was interested in. It wasn't something I was excited about, but I still went to Mass. And to be honest, I believe that that was the thread that kept me connected to my faith, even if it wasn't emotionally connected, that I was still connected by the grace of God to the sacrament. And um, So anyway, I'm kind of biased in saying that casting judgment on those who might show up late or whatever, but or leave early or whatever. Um, so that's maybe part of the answer to the question. We, it's really out of selflessness. They want to leave the good seats for others, <laughs> you know. So it's really just humility and self-sacrifice, I think, is what, it's what it boils down to. Might have been a little sarcasm there. Um, because you see Catholics at the movies or sporting events. I don't know, do you see them sitting at the back? Oh, you can sit in the front, take the good seats. Just a reflection, I don't know. Um, one of the questions that came up is what is the church's teaching on, this was actually just asked recently, what is the church's teaching on tattoos and body piercing? There is no formal declaration of the church and the popes in the history of the church have not writ written documents on body piercing and tattoos. Um, so sadly, we kind of you kind of have to approach it because it tends to be a culturally in, uh, a culturally culturally different according to the different cultures. So some cultures. It's very widely accepted. Uh, it's part of culture. It's part of the society that there's particular tattooing and piercing. So typically, uh, it's not something that is you know preached upon as a as a negative thing in those cultures where it's sort of widely accepted. Some will use that argument in our culture today that it's becoming more common, more widely accepted, and therefore, you know. It should be completely acceptable. I, the bishops haven't come out and said anything necessarily yay or nay, so it's sort of left up to individual you know, priests and, and to kind of make statements on or write articles about. So I, I don't necessarily make statements on it, but I do have some thoughts. Oh, you're interested in hearing my thoughts. <laughs> I guess one of my one of my thoughts is because uh, I know I'm sure there's many in this room that have a tattoo or have particular piercing or whatever, which is just fine. So I don't want to alienate. But my perception is when you get a tattoo, generally it has within the mind, there generally is, I think, within the mind, an expectation that somebody will see that, whether that's a significant other, whether that's, you know, somebody will see it. And so, in my mind, at its core, it is seemingly based upon a, a kind of a look at me type of culture, which I think in many ways our culture tends to be shifting closer and closer to, which is a, um, 
I've got to be my own person. I've got to draw attention in whatever particular way, whatever unique way I've got to draw particular attention to uh, something about myself in order to be that, to have that unique personality. I think some of that can tend, can tend towards, or can be tended towards within um, tattoos and body piercings. I'm sure those of you, I've, there's arguments on both sides. You're going to find priests that will that will say that it's completely fine and acceptable. There's priests who have tattoos and probably piercings and such. So you'll find a wide variety. I guess that's just my own personal reflections on it. Is is that is at its core? Is that maybe some of where it's rooted in? Is it um, maybe you have a differing perception on that? But that's my own because it's left sort of not as a statement. There's not really a formal statement. I guess it's kind of left to. Uh, to particular thoughts and reflections in that regard. So, yeah, awesome. So we're uh, we're about out of time. <laughs> <laughs> After two questions, um, any follow-ups? Any rebuttals? No. Um, one of the other questions. These are some fun questions. I like them. Um, is drinking alcohol, especially for, especially for minors, technically against our religion? One of Jesus' miracles was making wine. Illegal or not, is the Catholic Church against it? So alcohol in and of itself is not sinful. Uh, in fact, there's multiple references to wine in the scriptures, and there's some, I've even heard some, some theologians who have said or made reference to the fact that it was not alcoholic wine that is typically, by most historians, uh, gauging ridiculous to say that the wine was not alcoholic in Jesus' time. Uh, the scriptures are pretty clear that, that wine brings warmth and joy to men's hearts. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that that wasn't just a grape juice, so. Now, in the same way, alcohol has caused horrific destruction uh, in many families' lives and in many relationships, um, and therefore is, is something to take very seriously. and, and but there are many things that have caused great destruction, uh, which in and of themselves are not sinful of themselves. So as St. Thomas Aquinas would posit, you know, things in moderation. And that typically is the moral standing when it comes to, to things that bring joy to, uh, to life is things in moderation. So, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas also talked about games of chance such as you know, poker and cards and those kind of things, that those things in moderation are acceptable forms of enjoyment. Um, now obviously as with alcohol, gambling can become destructive and sinful, um, but in and of itself it is, it is not, and so nor, nor is alcohol. Now when it comes to the age, we are also bound as Christians, as Catholics, to the law of the land as long as that law is formed and is a just law. So we do, we do uh, as Catholics, it is expected of us to follow the civil law. And so then breaking civil law technically incurs some level of, of sinfulness because we're not following that expectation, which also is in accord with, the, if it's in accord with the moral law of the church. So. So technically, uh, breaking traffic violate you know traffic violations those kind of I mean they're obviously very minor but it's still breaking civil law and so that would be breaking the law and therefore wrong um, in the eyes of the church and so too would be um, underage drinking in that sense it's breaking civil law and so that's the level of of immorality if you want to say uh, with it basically. Any follow-up questions with any of those things? So technically, if you're in a country where it's not against civil law, then you're, then obviously you're, you're fine. Or if it's 
according to civil law, which I've heard both sides of this coin according to our um, United States civil law. I've heard just recently, well, I heard some years ago that it was legal to, for parents to allow their children as long as they're in their presence and their home to allow their children to drink alcohol and, and as minors or as under the age of 21. Then I heard that it wasn't legal. Now then I heard just recently that it is legal. So I don't know what the civil law says on that, but I've heard both sides of that. Anyway, if that is the case and it's legal, then that would obviously be moral as long as it's not. Depends on the state. Is it a state law? OK. Not other people's children, but you at home with your own children. Oh, really? Yeah. So like grocery store, or gas station, beer? OK. Anyway, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. OK. So we're getting all the important stuff out of the way. <laughs> Let's see, tattoos, piercing, alcohol. Uh, <laughs> is there anything else to talk about? I think that's pretty much it. Um, one of the questions was about in the liturgy, when does the focus of reverence go from the back altar or the tabernacle to the front altar? So it said, I've been told that once Mass starts, only the priest is the one who genuflects. What does that mean for people walking in late is the question. Um, so that it, there is something to that, that at Mass, so in the, in, the, in the liturgy of Mass, the focus becomes the altar. So the altar sort of is the center of focus. And that's why when people pass in front of the altar, they should bow, or they would bow, like lectors and stuff would bow to the altar. So the reverence is to the altar, whereas when Mass is not going on in the church, the focus of reverence is to the tabernacle because we believe that is the real presence of Jesus Christ. Um, whereas during the Mass, because the altar is the place of the sacrifice, the place of the, the meal, the table, that is where Jesus becomes present. So that's the focus of reverence during the Mass. So that is that question. Um, How does the church and you feel about followers of Christ who are not Catholic and or believers who are not Christian? So I think we talked a little bit about that one when we talked about baptism, because I referenced the fact that uh, there are different types of baptism, that there is you know, obviously baptism by water, but there's also baptism of desire baptism by um, blood, baptism of blood in the sense that those who may have not been formally baptized, those who may not have formally proclaimed a faith in Jesus Christ, who have not received the message of the gospel, are not held responsible for something that they have not yet heard and therefore have not yet rejected. So basically, our salvation and this, the possibility of salvation depends upon our rejection of the truth. If we have not yet received the truth, then we can't possibly reject it, and then we can't possibly be held responsible for that. We talked, I think I talked a little bit about that when we talked about baptism. Um, so that's kind of the perception of, so in, in that sense, then we love, I mean, certainly we love all human beings who are created in the image and likeness of God, uh, who are the beauty of God's creation. Um, but that's the perception of salvation. There is the possibility of salvation for those outside of the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church. There is salvation for those outside of the, the physical name of Jesus Christ. Well, in the sense of proclamation of faith, but obviously they have, they are, if they are saved, they are saved through Christ. And that salvation, as we believe it, was deemed through Christ uh, by his church, that he started a church specifically to continue to carry out his mission of salvation. Anyway, that's that one. 
Any follow-up questions to any of that, or any questions that come up that you that have been sparked in the last little bit? Yeah. That's a great question, especially in light of Vin Diesel. <laughs> Sorry, random reference to, which is a sad thing, the death of Paul Walker. Uh, but Vin Diesel has been saying multiple times, I just happened to be watching the news, and they have clips of him on the news saying, you know, now we have an angel up in heaven. And I'm like, he's not an angel. So we believe that the, the angels are specifically creatures created by God with a particular purpose. That's what the word angel means, uh, is, is voice of God or messenger of God. And so angels are created specifically as the messengers of God, and so they have that role within the scriptures. And so now that's sort of, I don't know if it's Hollywood or culture, at what point it became that we go up to heaven and get our wings. I'm not sure where that all stemmed from originally. Uh, at, at what point it became sort of, whether it was It's a Wonderful Life or before that, but uh, that, you know, until, until it, you know, once you die, you're just up there waiting to be able to get your wings and be, become a first class angel or whatever. That's not exactly. So, yeah, we don't believe that there's a, any kind of interchanging between angels and human beings uh, that were a completely different, different um, object of creation. Um, and so, so angels are created without bodies. And so in some ways, angels, it is said by some of the saints that angels are envious of humanity because they're created in the flesh. So they have the opportunity to, to encounter God in the flesh in the incarnation. Um, so they're created as pure spirits. They can take on visible form. So they, in the scriptures, they, they appear as visible forms, but they don't, they're not in the, in the flesh in the same way that human beings are. Um, so yeah, what we believe and understand about them is what the scriptures reveal to us about them. So human beings, when they go to heaven, we are pure spirit until the end of time where we believe the resurrection of the body where we are basically in, in the flesh of, of our resurrected bodies as Christ did after his resurrection. So that's, if there's any, and again, using terms like waiting and periods of time when we talk of heaven kind of is challenging too because we believe it to be an existence outside of this world of time and that's the the challenge of it and even speaking about it oftentimes is very because our our words and our language don't do justice to what we formally understand it to be yet we know to some degree that our our resurrected bodies as Christ's resurrected body was and is in heaven that there has to be some allowance and understanding of that which I could go on and on about like the depths of physics and metaphysics as to how that's even possible to speak of our resurrected bodies, which are material things in an existence outside of the boundaries of time, which is the measuring of matter and substance. And yeah, anyway, but I won't do that. So you can, we can have that conversation after if you have a deep interest in that, but was there a follow-up or yes? So, uh, so typically the archangels are the ones that are named by name in scripture. Um, so traditionally Raphael, Gabriel, um, Michael, um, are the, the three main, the main ones that are referenced in scripture. That's because they're given that special title of archangel because of the fact that they have a place within the story of salvation. Basically, um, it just kind of draws special attention to them as a, it's a, choir of angels, which is referenced, the choirs of angels are referenced in the scriptures as well, which are seraphim, cherubim, I'm not going to name all, there's nine choirs of angels um, that are made reference to in the, in the scriptures, but um, 
Anyway, so archangels are one of the nine levels or choirs of angels. Yeah, does that answer your question? Brandon looks like you have a... Why is Michael? Uh, well, oh, so because he's not like your typical... Yeah, that's a good question, actually, because saint is reserved for those who are... Basically, it's in, in all other cases, human beings who have achieved salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, I would say because they have a place in the scriptures and therefore can have a connection to us as human beings. So those who are canonized saints, the reason for canonization of saints is because we draw special attention to the way that they successfully live their lives for Jesus Christ and therefore have some benefits in relationship to us as Christians who are still walking the journey. That's the idea behind canonized saints. And so typically, obviously, the angels would be individuals, beings, who served Christ in some specific way. And as human beings, we can have a unique connection to them because of that service. Um, I would say that's probably why. Uh, it is atypical in the sense of, of saints. And, but that word simply means holy, sanctus, which is holy. And that's typically anything that's in heaven is holy. So if you want to get critical, that te technically we're just calling him holy Michael because of the fact that he's he, he's in heaven as an angelic being so anyway there you go that would be my answer to that question The reason, the reason why the church sort of had a negative perspective on cremation is because when it comes to the funeral liturgy and the rites of the funeral, there is a, a deep significance to the body and the significance of the symbolism of the body and the body being placed into the earth as Christ was placed into the tomb um, and that symbolism of the prayers talking about the body and the resurrection of the body and so that's where there was a struggle with with allowing cremation at first because of the fact that it seemed to go against the imagery that we carry out in burial that it's the burial of the body as Christ was buried in the tomb so that was where there was I think some hesitancy with that I think um, so it is something that that was a discipline of the church. It wasn't some doctrinal teaching on cremation. It was just a discipline that that was the way that it was done. That was the way that the prayers were formed. There has been an allowance with that. So as with any discipline, there can be a change in the disciplines of the church. Um, and so that is one of the areas where it has been changed. Why I think is it's still favored that the body be present for the funeral. Because as human beings, there's something about needing to give, to have that closure. And it's hard to have that closure with just a picture and a little urn sitting up there. I mean, not to be disrespectful of anybody who has had you know, family or friends you know, cremated. I mean, I had an uncle who was cremated and I did the funeral with just the urn. And it was, it's, you know, it's challenging because we, I mean, in some ways we need that sense of body. We need the viewing. We need those final moments of saying goodbye, seeing the casket even if it's not physically seeing the body there's something different about seeing this you know the, the thing that contains the body and its form into the ground so again with the the sacramental realities of of the church and the significance of the body that's part of the reason why there's a so it's even encouraged even if cremation is taking place and this was i think at one point there was funeral homes would allow like rental of caskets for the services Sometimes that's not, I don't know that they allow that anymore because of, well, anyway, I won't go into the details, I guess. Um, so anyway, expense-wise, it's making much more a common occurrence to choose cremation because it's becoming more and more ridiculous to get funeral things, uh, caskets and all that kind of stuff. 
So it, yeah, it's an acceptable form. Uh, what is expected with cremation is that the burial still takes place, so that there is a spe specified place of memorial designated for the person buried into the ground again as Christ was buried in the tomb. So that is something that we don't necessarily agree with is just taking grandpa and sprinkling him on the golf course or whatever because that was the place he liked to be uh, is that we continue in the in that tradition which is, again stems from Christ um, and that there be a, 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 a excuse me a common place of memorial that we can go and that's significant for us as again as human beings have a place to go to memorialize that person to to speak to that person, to pray for that person. Um, so that's the yeah, tradition of that. Yes? So, on a different topic, is yes. like demonic possession and exorcism, is that still a thing with a new marriage, or is that just like in the old days in Hollywood? <laughs> An exorcist. Mm -hmm. is that uh, each diocese is kind of technically supposed to have a priest who would, if was requested, perform the rites of exorcism. Um, now there are rites of exorcism in the traditional, you know, demonic possessed person, but more typically called upon are the rites of exorcism for, like, a house that's experiencing weird stuff, or somebody who's, yeah, in some kind of way, a, a facility, a building or something that would be experiencing weird things that they may call upon. So we do believe in the, in the presence of, the, obviously, the spiritual realm, that that's something that's extremely prevalent in the scriptures, and so therefore, uh, you know, angels and demons, we, do, we believe, do exist, and, and uh, Satan does exist as much as they have been holly... Yeah, Hollywoodified, and, the, and that's what makes them so, I mean, they become almost mythical now because of the way that Hollywood has portrayed it, and so it becomes something that's illogical or, you know, or, you know, just ridiculous because we think of Satan as this guy in red tights with a pitchfork. Uh, well, yeah, that is ridiculous. That's certainly not the scriptural perception of who Satan is, who Lucifer is. Lucifer is the angel the light bearer, that's what that word means, and the, the highest, be most beautiful of all the angels. And therefore, a Satan doesn't work as some huge monster that comes to scare us, but rather attractively to draw us in. That's how he works, is he's the, the bearer of light. So he typically draws people in through attractive means and then you know, gets them addicted to whatever that attractive means was. But anyway... That's not your question. <laughs> Getting back to your question, which is my style. I like to talk about things that I like to talk about. Um, <laughs> one of the legitimate follow-up questions to that is, does it still happen? Why don't we see it? I mean, in scriptures, it was extremely prevalent. Why don't we see it today? Um, there, there's not a formalized statement on this, so this is kind of my theory, and I don't know if I, if I mentioned this at all in a class. I know I mention it fairly frequently, but my own theory, why was it so prevalent in the scriptures, is possession. So demonic possession of a human being is not a typical action of Satan, but rather of a demon, but rather sort of a wind threatened, sort of like a... a um, bear that's cornered or something is going to attack, whereas otherwise it might not. If it's, if it's pressured, if it's in the face of sincere and complete holiness, that there would, as a last-ditch effort, lash out. So in the time of Christ, that's my theory as to why you saw it extremely prevalent when God incarnate is walking the earth, when the apostles are performing miracles in the name of Christ. You're seeing in the face of this great holiness these last-ditch efforts to lash out, to grasp. I mean, it's a, it's a very, you know, grasping type of a, of a move by demons um, when threatened. Why don't we see it in the United States, especially today? They don't feel threatened. That's my theory, I guess. There's not a 
huge prevalent presence of holiness that's really threatening Satan. Uh, he's got a pretty good grip on things without it. So that's my theory, I guess. Again, that's not the church's proclamation. That's just my own perception. But um, there was one more thing I was going to say with that. Oh, yeah, in, uh, in third world countries where faith is thriving, and you see a pure sort of grassroots faith because they're not attached to material goods so much like we are in the United States. Interestingly, you see a lot more prevalence of demonic possession in third world countries. I don't know, you know. Some, some of you know, the intellectual minds will say it's obviously because we have a, now attested to there wasn't demonic possession, it was just people that were crazy and you know, they were psychologically messed up and therefore, um, and maybe they would use that as a reason why they would see this in third world, they don't have the you know, health care that we have today to be able to diagnose these psychological disorders. Say what you want, that's my perception of things, I guess. But anyway. Any other questions that I can take 15 minutes to answer? I love that. Those are like some of my favorite topics, actually. So I get I get all fired up. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. So spiritual warfare again. I think it's along that same lines. Is when we start to step out into the path of holiness precisely in those moments that you can expect and anticipate, like saints oftentimes described physical attacks and specifically when they were walking very true to the line and the example of Jesus Christ. Um, so there's some saints stories of like in the middle of the night, like physically experiencing, you know, un, un, uh, unable to be described type of events of like being pinned down on the bed or whatever, lashings and stuff on their flesh. And um, so we do believe that that does exist. Again, I, I think it's something that exists specifically more so when we start to walk the path of holiness in a very sincere and com completely committed type of way. Um, unattached from the things of the world and, and that kind of thing, unattached from the chains that sometimes can bind us. Um, and that's, I mean, that's been the case even in my own life as I've, as I, at times when I've strived in holiness, you can guarantee that those are the times that temptation is the strongest and, you know, those things that I'm bombarded with in temptation is prevalent at those moments. Especially when something significantly significantly um, holy or something is in, in your journey of faith is coming in your own life. I think in particular in those moments that, not that we should, you know, walk around, you know, freaking out anticipating, but I think it's, there's a helpfulness of an awareness of that and to realize that those are oftentimes the times when we're most spiritually attacked. And again, not, not most times, rarely, if ever now, is it, you know, take physical form, but more, more so spiritual attack, temptation, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, good question. We are out of time, so if there were any questions that you particularly had that you really wanted answered before you leave, before we end up with the break, please feel free to uh, hang out and ask me afterwards. Um, yeah, so we are going to close with our prayer service, but before we do that, since this is our last class, I will see you all on Sunday. I forgot to say this at the beginning, if for some reason there is something that comes up or some, there's some reason why you wouldn't be able to be there, please let me know that, uh, either by word or by telephone or by email or something. Um, that would be awesome. Just we can work with it, but just let me know. We can talk about it. So uh, those of you who are bringing main dishes, I uh, know who you are. Thank you for volunteering for that. You would be what? You can too? OK, that would be five, actually. So thank you. Um, 
Anything else before we break for the semester? Or for the Yes. Right. So I think we'll do that with the team members. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned uh, no later than 5.30 is to, to get here by 5.30. And, well, yeah. That's cool. Okay, let's do our... We're going to do the, uh, should be in your binders, the second Eucharist. So Eucharist part two was the prayer service, which comes quickly after the part one, towards the end of the semester. Hopefully. <laughs> Better be in there. Should be ready for prayer, I think. I think, isn't it? Or was it after prayer? Do we have a page? Oh, they're the green ones. Yeah, 92 is the page number if you can't find it. Hey, can I look up here, guys? Uh, is there... So we'll do down the, down the middle again. That, that, are you leading, maybe? Okay, then this will be side one. That'll be side two. And the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, we have no need of our praise. If we are praised, let the result be greater to your love. Unite together with your presence, we are able to offer you praise. May what we learn from your teaching be true and able us to grow in our appreciation of the gift of your grace, the bread of life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. O oh Lord, with all my heart, I will sing your praises before the gods. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord. For all of them will hear your words. The Lord is great. He cares for the humble. But he keeps his distance from the proud. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O oh Lord, endures forever. For you made me. As it was in the beginning, is now, and without end. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, awesome. We will see you on Sunday. Shoot.
I realized what I forgot to do is have everybody fill out one of those, but we'll, uh, I'll have you guys do that another time. Oh, hey!